you'll often hear the saying, getting in our own way. What is that and why do we do it? So we might make a decision that we want to eat healthier or exercise more and we start off brilliantly. And then, you know, something happens and we, um, you know, old habits uh, are, are more convenient and we just fall back into them. Our brain always wants to succeed. So if we think that we're failing at something, we'll often refocus and all of a sudden, you know, we're we're back where we started. Now, the good news is that that just makes us normal, crazy people, according to my guest today, Willie Horton. And the better news is that there is something that we can do about it. We can train our brain to be more present and, you know, and that helps us to make um, all of those little small decisions that we make during the day, whether it's about whether we get up and go for a walk or whether we choose a piece of fruit over some sweets when we go into the shop. If we're more present, we're more likely to make the better choice for us. Now, anxiety is another issue that, you know, we all deal with at some point in our lives, you know, and for a variety of reasons. And Willie definitely helped me when my thoughts were spiraling negatively and I knew that I needed to uh, get some control back over the way my brain was thinking and just, you know, regain my sense of myself. He explained meditation uh, in a really practical way, um, in in a way which made sense to me and also made it sound like something that was a manageable practice, you know, something that I could incorporate into my daily life. So let me just tell you a little bit about Willie just before we get into our chat. So Willie Horton is a psychologist and he has been working for himself as a consulting psychologist since 1996. Prior to that, he practiced tax for KPMG and PwC and held senior leadership positions in the financial and banking sectors. Um, He was born in Dublin in 1958 and moved with his wife, Lisa, and their three children to the French Alps in 2002. Their children now live and work in Paris. Using advances in cognitive psychology and neuroscience, Willie specializes in enabling his clients to find the kind of stress-free work-life balance that inexorably leads them to living the kind of lives they want and achieving the kind of goals that are unimaginable to the ordinary mind's way of thinking. So Willie is a published author. His first book, To Succeed, Just Let Go, was published in London in 2006. He is the creator of the Psychology of Success online program and the Cybercoach platform, which is used by coaches in Europe and the US, which incorporates the Mindfulness Measurement Index. He also has a great podcast um, also called To Succeed, Just Let Go, and that is really worth um, really worth following. Willie helps a wide variety of people, you know, whether it's personally like myself or small business owners to large corporations. And what he teaches can be applied by any of us to show up for ourselves, to be more present and to be the best version of ourselves that we can be. So I really hope you enjoy my chat with Willie Horton. Better. Now we're good to go. (laughs) Now we're good to go. (laughs) Um, So Willie, your career began in finance. And at some point you realized that to succeed in any area of life, like professionally, um, you know, personally, that actually the the key thing that we need to do is get control of this thing between our ears. So could you maybe tell me a little bit about, about that realization and, and how that happened? Yeah, I'm originally um I'm originally an accidental accountant and an accidental tax consultant. I was about this a few days ago because the 47th anniversary of my starting work comes up next week wow um you're looking well on and it. it's also <laughs> it's all it's a 15th of march but uh, the 15th of march uh, uh 1992 is also significant because that's the date i met uh, a guy called jerry kushel in the swiss alps who is the guy that opened my eyes uh, as a banker at the time, uh, to the madness, what I now call normal crazy people. I, I got a job in 1990 to turn a, a, a failed bank around. Um, it was way ahead of its time. It had gone bankrupt a full 20 years before the financial crash in 1988. Uh, and I got this job and I would take uh, the leadership team away to nice hotels to strategize, as one does, and to come up with new action plans. And We'd all thing and then go back to base and they'd all do the same stuff that got them into difficulties in the first place. And I could not figure out why apparent adults would behave in such a bizarre way. So I went looking for help to try to figure out what was wrong with them. Discovered this guy that I've just mentioned in the Swiss Alps. 
and uh, discovered that there was nothing wrong with them that wasn't wrong with the rest of us. We're all normal, crazy, because we operate on automatic pilot. Uh, we operate with the brain that uh, evolution gave us. Um, and the brain that evolution gave us is fine-tuned to uh, potential life situations and little else in other words, brain that you have is not designed to enable you um fulfill your dreams or achieve your goals and objectives designed to enable you lose weight or get fit or have a, a great business it's designed for survival and that's about the heart of it uh, and when i realized that i said to myself oh god that's far more exciting than banking that's what i want to do so i was an accidental accountant an accidental banker and in the end i suppose i'm an accidental psychologist well stumbled from one thing into another yeah, or or it's like a, a natural path that that was revealed to you, you know, when because you were sort of open to to what was going on around you, you know, which is what mindfulness is is all about. Now, isn't Lynn? It's not a really interesting point because when you are mindful, or when you have your what, what cognitive psychology calls your attentional spotlight turned on, the way forward is little literally illuminated mm -hmm. for you, uh, but your mind needs to be open. Um, you know, somebody said to me only yesterday, um, I, I was talking to at a group of people on an advanced meditation retreat that finished yesterday morning. And one of the people towards the end said to me, God, you need to be desperate to have a lifeline thrown to you. You know, in this in the way that we're talking about being led forward by your attentional spotlight. And somebody else on the call said, if you opened your eyes, you'd realize that lifelines are being thrown to you every day. Mm. We don't see them when we're so caught up in our no. our the seventy thousand thoughts that you you talk about that are you know re repeat themselves every single day and we get into yeah. this uh, habit and routine of of them um, that that we sort of think we're not going to be able to get out of easily. But what what I really what really appeals to me about when when I started listening to your podcast and um you know joining the the Facebook live I. I really uh, um, appreciate the way that you make it very simple, Willie. You know, you you say, no, actually change is very simple, but you just have to get down back down to the fundamentals. And part of that is understanding that we are all normal, crazy people. And that if we can get control of our mind, then everything else kind of falls into place when we're living in the present moment. Um, so that. Uh, I suppose, brings us on to uh, mindfulness and meditation and how important that is. And oftentimes people are put off for some reason by the word meditation. And they imagine that they need to carve out, you know, a half an hour a day, sit on a cushion and achieve some sort of Zen like, you know, state. But actually, that's not really uh, necessary. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of uh, misconceptions uh, about meditation. Um, but go way back. Uh, I mean, I started working with a leadership team in the West of Ireland in the late 1990s and was told I couldn't use the word meditation because it had put the, the, the Catholics in the group off. Uh, and, and, you know, that, there's still a lot of that around. Uh, well, back in the 1990s, um, I, I, I was at a disadvantage because I didn't have all the research that I have available to me now. Um, now we know that med what meditation does to the mind, what meditation does to how we make our decisions or our choices. Uh, meditation uh, enables us to behave properly rather than misbehave on the automatic pilot and that we were talking about a minute ago, the 70,000 thoughts that lead us astray every day. Well, uh, we know what meditation we know what meditation does to the body. It does the exact opposite to what stress does to the body. And I suspect you've actually covered stress uh, or at least in the digestive system in yes. one of your previous podcasts. So your listeners know about this stuff already. Um, but there are so many misgivings and misconceptions about meditation because of the way it's taught. And it's taught that you have to abide by a set of rules. You have to sit down, wrap your legs around your ears. You have to do it for a certain amount of time. And you have to follow the religiously. God help us. Really... Uh, what meditation is, is it's like hopping on a treadmill in the gym. It's far more effective than that, but it's like hopping on a treadmill in the gym um, to ensure that you just train your mind to pay attention to the reality of the here and now, even if that's just your breathing uh, for a couple of minutes. And 
you know, the research now strongly suggests that seven or eight minutes a day uh, will do it for you. I've been involved uh, with a project in the UK for the last seven years called the Focused Farmers Project. And what we discovered was that regularity of meditation is what makes a difference to one's stress levels and one's ability to achieve one's goal, not the duration of the meditation. So seven or eight minutes every day every day is what act is actually important and 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 you know there are simple ways of doing it as somebody said to me last week my the, the process that i offer that, that's what he said he said it's a simple process for complicated people and i said to him no it's a simple process for people who think they're complicated and we need to get our thinking out of the way and that's what meditation mm -hmm. enables us to do there's a saying for, which I think dates back to 1830s, you know, the 1830s. And it's them. Um, we think we are who we think other people think we are, you know. So we put way too much emphasis on what we think about things. And, and you talk about how we think ourselves into feeling stressed about something we have to do. You know, meditation stops those 70,000 thoughts that six or seven minutes every single day just interrupts those 70,000 um, those repetitive thoughts and helps our brain to get back in touch with what's you know what we want to do well there are a couple of key things in, in relation to what you just said the 70,000 thoughts that that's a calculation from the neural lab in UCLA uh, the 70,000 thoughts are largely the same 70,000 thoughts every day 97% of today's thoughts are the same as yesterday's and tomorrow will be a repeat performance and they're the same thoughts you've been having since you were 12 or 13 and they're the thoughts all based on your childhood memories so you're using your childhood memories as a means of trying to figure out what's going on now that that's crazy that's mm. absolutely crazy and it isn't just that uh, the thoughts stop us from um, you know, knowing what's going on. Now. The thoughts actually stop us in our tracks in terms of knowing who we are and knowing what we're capable of and knowing what we need to do to change our lives in the direction that we want our lives to go. The thoughts literally get in our way. If we could use our minds uh, in the way in which uh, evolution developed our minds for threat situations in any situation or every situation life would be completely different let's let briefly can i compare the two uh, you you said there was too much thinking going on a minute ago you know i could have met you for the first time this morning so who i think i am would try to figure out who i think i am thinks who you think you are and then i will think how to react on the basis of that stream of thoughts some five or ten steps removed from reality and that goes for every situation even if you meet someone new or it, it goes for every situation so in other words thinking has suddenly frozen me in my tracks now the mind when it's free of thought works this way i'm trotting through the bush uh out hunting gathering as I, as I was hundreds, thousands of years ago. And I'm confronted by a man or woman eating beast. And if I stopped to think about it, I'd be dead. Now, and that, that's the key thing, because our mind is designed in certain circumstances like that to not think at all, to just do. So my subcortical brain in that situation knows exactly where, am I, at, where I am. Modern neuroscience tells us that it has a three-dimensional map of where I am, even if I was never in that place before. And it knows exactly how to get myself out of there by the most effective, efficient, and least effortful route. That's how the brain works when we don't get in our own way thinking about it. Mm -hmm. So if you could take your thinking mind out of the way, a couple of things happen. Number one, the parts of the brain that are only focused on threats as a result of the way evolution designed the brain, become focused on threats. We obviously need to stay focused on threats and opportunities, the lifelines that I was talking about a minute ago. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, I know where I am. I know what's going on. I know what I need to do. And I just do it without any effort because I don't think about 
yeah. how I'll feel if I do it, or I don't think about whether I'm up to it, or I don't think about, oh, I couldn't do that, or I couldn't say that, or what would people think of me if I if I behaved this way or did that? What would people think of me if I was if I did something and failed? Or worse, because I come across this quite regularly, what would my friends think of me if I did something and succeeded? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's it's basically taking every situation and person at face value and not bringing the baggage of the past in to inform what you think about it or you know worries about the future and that's that's always when we're in that sort of state that's always when we're happiest and when we get the best results you know when we're most productive as well. It's it's when we're in what the University of Chicago calls flow, mm. where I just do what I have to do. There's no effort involved where time bends, there's a lot of research in relation to that, you know, the old expression that time flies when you're having fun. Mm. Um, Time is my version of reality. Uh, Mm. So, you know, otherwise time wouldn't fly or Mm. drag, you know, the clock wouldn't stand still when you're bored. Mm. So it's all about your state of mind and your state of mind uh, literally dictates your experience of reality and your ability to create the reality that you want. And the key thing is, because you specifically asked me about meditation, is that meditation does all of that for you. Mm. You know, somebody said to me a couple of days ago, what am I going to have to do now in terms of putting a plan together to change my life? Or what am I going to have to do when I confront this particular individual that I have to deal with? You don't need to worry about any of that. Your mind will do it for you in the same way as your mind would have got you out of the way of a man-eating or woman-eating beast five or Mm. 7,000 years ago. If you just let it, you don't have to worry about anything. Mm. All you have to do is meditate for seven or eight minutes every morning Mm. and, and literally watch what happens. Exactly. And you can have your your end sort of goal, your aims in mind, but not the detail. Like, for example, if you need to have a conversation with somebody, as you mentioned, don't plan what you're going to say, because it never the conversation never goes that way, you know, but just, you know, have in mind the outcome that you're hoping for. But let trust that if you're in the present moment, you'll know what to say to get that to achieve that outcome. Is that Fair enough, yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Because yeah. ultimately, uh, the practice of meditation uh, gets you to the point where free of thought, you understand who you are and what you're capable of. Mm. And it enables you get to the point where you can trust yourself, which is basically what you're talking about there. Mm. I, I had a conversation a few months ago with a, a client who um, had an important meeting with her boss. It was a make or break meeting with her boss. And she said to me, what am I going to say? I said, you'll know what to say if you're present. What will I say if he says this? I said, you don't need to worry about that at all. What you need to do is meditate for a couple of minutes before you have the meeting. Prior to that, you need to have said to yourself, this is how I want to feel after the meeting. So now I've turned up with my goal in mind. And I, I, so there are two parts to this. Number one, I have my goal in mind. I know how I want to feel after the meeting. And number two, I've spent a couple of minutes beforehand clearing my mind so I fully turn up to the meeting. I said, if you do that, you'll dance through the meeting like a ballerina. You'll say things Mm -hmm. that your thinking mind wouldn't believe you could say. Because people regularly say to me, oh, I I amazed myself or I surprised myself or somebody said to me recently, I super surprised myself as a result of something I said that I could never have imagined myself saying. And that's the problem. What they mean it's like I never thought that I could say that exactly. it's the thought that gets in the way and the meditation is like going to the gym for the body it's like training the brain it's training those neural pathways in the brain to be in the present moment so that's why the consistency every day is more important than say meditating for half an hour on a Sunday that six or seven or eight minutes every day is training the brain so that it's like a muscle that that you know that you are more and more in the present moment. Is that would that yep. would you say that's accurate? Well, yeah. Well, yeah, the, the research is actually a lot more exciting than that because when we meditate, the neural pathways that we use to be present expand by up to a thousand percent in diameter. Wow. Wow. And the neural pathways are restructured in the parts of the brain that enable us to get out of the life threatening situation 10,000 years ago. So they behave differently. As I said, they're now focused on opportunities as well as threats. Um, 
And what's been discovered is I create brand new neural pathways in the brain, even somebody of my age, my advanced age. The latest research shows that if you started meditating in your 70s, uh, you would actually start creating new neural pathways in the brain. 75 wow. years of age. Yeah. What's even more exciting is that the latest research shows that at 75, you know, some of my cognitive function has begun to diminish just as a result of aging. And some of the neural pathways in my brain will have uh, withered and died. They'll have atrophied as a result of aging. If I start meditating when I'm 75, the atrophication process is reversed. I can meditate myself younger. Wow. That is amazing. And it's, it is so achievable, like say six to eight minutes every day, you know, we can, we can all find that time whether it's setting the clock a few minutes earlier it's not too onerous and um, literally just having a comfortable position, sitting up and then, you know, maybe got, we'll talk about the, the meditations later on. But um, I mean, for, for those kind of results, it's it's certainly worth considering for everybody, isn't it? And <clears throat> the of course, the other impact, apart from obviously the impact on mindfulness that meditation has, are the is the physical impact that it has on our bodies, you know, and the improved health that regular meditation uh, is associated with. Well, we now know, you know, because I think you've talked, you mentioned to me that you talked about it before, mm. that uh, stress um, increases the heart rate, the blood pressure and the production of LDL fatty cholesterol in the cardiovascular system. Stress suppresses the digestive system and the immune system. Meditation does the exact opposite to all of the above. Mm -hmm. it, in, it reduces blood pressure. It reduces heart rate. It reverses the buildup of fatty cholesterol in the cardiovascular system. It doesn't just arrest it, it reverses it. And it boosts it boosts the immune system. It boosts the digestive system. Um, if you were going to the gym for your body and meditated for seven or eight minutes before you went to the gym, there's research that shows you lose um, fatty tissue and gain muscle muscular tissue quickly over the course of eight weeks because of what meditation does to the body in conjunction with physical exercise. Wow. So it's, it basically enhances and, uh, and makes your, your, um, your workout much more beneficial. Yep. Um, oh yeah. So I suppose one of the reasons that I'm interested in this as a nutritionist is because I can give people, you know, uh, I can give clients a, a plan and I can suggest tweaks to their diet but without managing stress, those uh, even if they can manage to make those changes, they're not as beneficial because obviously when we're stressed, our digestion is sluggish. But as well as that, the changing of the habits is the hardest thing for most people. You know, just changing daily habits because we're when we are not mindful, we are mindless and we're going into the shop and we're just buying things automatically. And next thing we're in the car and we realize we have a coffee and a muffin instead of maybe an apple and a tea or something, you know. Um, so it's all of those. It's all of those decisions that we're making all day, every day that we're making mindlessly that build our habits, you know. And so I would say with most of my clients, I do need to talk about, you know, mindfulness. And sometimes it's just starting with breathing exercises. And, you know, I, I, I remember one client who was totally flummoxed by literally hydration and breathing exercises a couple of times a day and the difference that made to their blood pressure. Because their diet wasn't awful, but their blood pressure was really high, you know. So um, the, the physical impact of it is, like amazing but it's I think sometimes it seems too simple for people you know they think really is that it you know and yet it is yeah as I said a few minutes ago a simple process for complicated people or people mm. that think life should be complicated um the really interesting thing about what you've just said is you could give somebody a dietary plan and because of the way we operate habitually because we talked about the 70,000 thoughts mm. and the automatic pilot earlier on, because of the way we operate habitually, the, the, the chances are, shouldn't say this on your podcast, but the chances are they will not follow the plan you've given them mm. until they get a, a handle on what's going on in their own head. 
absolutely yeah um i think i've mentioned to you before the, the story of a client of mine who was uh, who still is a nutritionist and who suffered from Lyme disease. And as a nutritionist, she knew there were things that she simply should not eat. Uh, they exacerbated her Lyme disease. And yet she'd go out with her girlfriends on a Friday evening to the pub and she'd sit down and order um, her favourite burger and, and chips and literally couldn't help herself. Mm -hmm. After she started meditating, after a couple of weeks, she was out habitually on a Friday night sat down in the pub, opened the menu, said, ooh, yes, burger and chips. And by the time the waiter came around, out of her mouth, as if she wasn't in control of her own state of mind, of course, the fact is how she was in control of her own yeah. state of mind, out of her mouth came fish and salad. Yeah. And she said, now it's got to the point where I'm wheeling my trolley around the supermarket and I take something unhealthy off the shelf and something else is controlling my hand and it puts it back on the shelf mm -hmm. and my hand goes off and picks something healthy off the shelf. Yeah. Why? Because we talked a few minutes ago about how meditation changes the way we make our decisions and we make our choices. If I have a goal in mind of being healthier of or of getting my um, blood pressure down or of losing weight, for example, if I have that goal in mind and I turn up to the here and now, my own mind, free of thought, will enable me to take the right things off the shelf and leave the rest behind. Yeah. It happens. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, so, you know, really, if we have, as you said, have the, our aim in mind, so we know what outcome we want, and it can be as simple, like, you know, the title of your podcast is to succeed, just let go. So it doesn't have to be overwhelming or overcomplicated. Decide what outcome you're looking for. Practice your meditation. And it is a practice. You know, we practice your meditation. If you just focus on that every day and then, you know, as you become more mindful, as you say, you start making the choices that are right for you. You know, we start making mindful decisions. You know, all of those tiny little decisions that we make every day all build up to having made then a big step forward towards our goal. Absolutely. No, you, you, you've you made a very important point because an awful lot of people think that uh, through meditating, they're not taking giant steps forward. And you, you have to sit people down and ask them, uh, where are you now versus where you were before you started this journey? Because it's only when they're back at the journey and all the little steps they've taken as Oh, I'm quite far down the road. Mm. And that's important because we need to know that well to encourage ourselves to continue on. It is. And that that's um, one of the reasons why when I see a client the first uh, at the first consultation, we're going through symptoms and making lists of, you know, what, what they're experiencing now. And then a month later, you'll go back and they'll actually have forgotten oh God, yeah, I, I was feeling that bloated or I was feeling this or that, you know, they'll have forgotten because when you're better, you're, you know, you're not really thinking about it. But it's really important to do that because then otherwise they won't put a value on what they have done to get there. Exactly. Yeah. Putting so, a value on it encourages you. Mm -hmm. And the encouraging you more, which gives you more results, which says in self-encouragement. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Willie, I, I I suppose came across you, I think on Facebook and I started listening to your podcast and I would definitely highly recommend it to everybody because the one thing about having that regular content and listen to your podcast every week is that, we, you know, habits can be broken as well. So things like holidays come up or whatever, you know. So we say, there, you know, if you miss your meditation a few days, um, listen to your podcast every week reminds me. Now it's you know I can just get back on it tomorrow you know grand if I didn't do it today I just I just do need to get back on it you know and I absolutely know that um you know those few minutes meditating every day everything just flows better um so I definitely highly recommend I'm going to be putting links to that to your uh, I know you have uh, your Facebook live every week as well and you have an online course. The online course is the psychology, psychology of success. success yeah. Sorry, psychology yeah. of success online program. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll put it, I'll put a link to that as well, because that really takes people through, um, you know, step by step. Uh, it's a whole step by step process. It's backed up by all the science. So if people are into um, understanding the science behind it, and I think a lot of people need 
uh, the science because it, without the science, it would only be a good idea that might have worked for me or you and mightn't work for anybody else. Mm. Science is compelling. Mm. The science is all there in the online program. Go ahead. As well, of course, as uh, fort fortnightly Zooms. You turn up on some of our fortnightly Zooms, yes. don't you? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I, you, the all of the content that you put out. Oh, and the Thursday video as well. The little video tip, which is oh, a yes. two or three minute video on a Thursday, is brilliant. You know, so I'd definitely be encouraging everybody to sign up. I, I certainly appreciate your, um, the way you present the information is very uh common sense you know matter of fact and it makes everything simple you know it's not complicated you know we can um you know i definitely think that it's it's uh, possible for us all to 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 do that six seven eight minutes um every day but sometimes we need to be reminded you know why it's good so your your content is brilliant for doing that you know so i certainly appreciate all of that and um Willie, thank, thank you. you so much for, for your time and your your insights as well. Um uh, a pleasure, Lynn. An absolute uh, pleasure. So my thanks again to Willie for his time. And um if you would like to learn some more about meditation or mini meditations, you know, certainly follow his content. Um also just wants to say that you know sometimes we are going through maybe something very traumatic or very tough. And you know, we might need some one to one support. So I would just encourage everybody to to find that support, you know, reach out and um, get some help because, um, you know, we all, we all need it at some time. So on to our store cupboard staple for this episode, and it is chocolate. So I bet you didn't think I was going to say that. But of course, I'm talking about dark chocolate and cacao in particular, or Theobroma cacao to give it its full title. Now that actually means food for the gods in Greek. So I kind of agree with that. Um, I get asked a lot about the difference between cacao nibs, cacao powder, cocoa powder and chocolate. So I thought I would start with explaining that and then we can move on to the nutritional benefits of cacao. So cacao originates in Central and South America and apparently the Mayans consumed cacao in drinks 4,000 years ago. But I think I think I read somewhere that approximately 70% of the cacao powder that we buy comes from West Africa these days. There are two edible parts, the seed or the bean, and then there's the fruit. Now, the seed of the bean is what's used to make cacao nibs, powder, cocoa and chocolate. And the fruit we probably wouldn't be so familiar with. It would be used to make beverages in in some countries like in South America, like Ecuador. Cacao nibs are the least processed. Now, they are simply crumbled raw cacao beans. Cacao powder is the dried paste of pressed nibs or, or cold pressed raw cacao beans. Now, whenever you see cold pressed, like you might see it on a jar of coconut oil or olive oil, this means that heat has not been introduced um, into the processing of the product. And heat is what can change the chemistry of the food. And so it, when you see cold pressed, this is always the most nutritional option or, or choice, you know, um, because the heat, heating has, um, you know, it can stress. Uh, some of the nutrients so cocoa powder is roasted and processed so there you go the, the heating process it just has stripped it you know it's going to be less nutritionally dense than cacao you can certainly substitute one for the other you know when you're when you're baking or using it um in in your food but um cocoa powder is just less nutritionally dense than cacao so the chocolate that we know in sweets and confectionery is made from cacao seeds which have been fermented, ground to a paste, sweetened and flavoured. But it's really all of the unnatural sugars, flavourings, trans fats, etc. that are added to confectionery that make them, you know, very, that, that mean that they have very little nutritional value, you know, and, and makes them more, more harmful when consumed in excess, you know, because when we eat them too often, these ingredients uh, put pressure on our blood glucose, you know, our blood sugar and um, our liver has to process them. And all of these things contribute to insulin resistance, you know, so moderation is key. Now, I know I probably don't really need to say that to you, you know, but it's always just worth um, say saying again. So what are the nutritional benefits of cacao nibs and powder? So cacao contains theobromine and this boosts our metabolism. Our metabolism is what converts our food into energy. So that's always a good thing. And um, it has a positive effect on our mood and our alertness. Now, actually, this 
compound theobromine is uh, the, the compound that's dangerous for cats and dogs. So that's why you shouldn't give chocolate to your pets, no matter how much they might look at you with a begging look on their face. So it also contains antioxidants and we love antioxidants because they prevent free radical damage to our cells. And this has an anti-aging effect. Now, when we think about anti-aging, it's not only about our face, which of course will be great, but also, you know, our organs and our cells as well. Cacao contains polyphenols, especially flavonoids, which support our heart health and healthy blood flow. You know, so that helps with blood pressure too. But blood, healthy blood flow is also good for our brain because, you know, our blood delivers oxygen and nutrients to our brain and, and um, the, the blood flow helps our memory as well. It contains tryptophan, which helps our body to make mood enhancing neurotransmitters like serotonin. It also uh, contains magnesium and magnesium I did a previous podcast on and it's a mineral which is behind like hundreds of chemical reactions in our body. Really important for energy production, blood pressure regulation, but also for our bones and our, our teeth as well and our muscles. You know, um, you might remember we use calcium to contract our muscle and magnesium to, to relax them. Cacao contains iron. Now it's a non-heme iron because it's from a plant. So to get the maximum benefits of the iron, you know, it, when you get it from plants, you always like to combine it with some vitamin C as well. Cacao contains um, phenylethylamine or PEA. And this is actually known as the love chemical. So P, the PEA in cacao is thought to lead to the mood and energy boosting effects that we that we feel, you know, it, it makes us feel good after eating it. It does contain some caffeine. So if you're pregnant or breastfeeding, definitely consume in moderation, of course. Um, you know, we, we don't want the baby to have, have too much caffeine. So when we add uh, cacao or cacao nibs into our store cupboard, what are we going to do with them? So you can always make lovely hot chocolate. Um, you can add a teaspoon or two of, of cacao powder into some milk or, or plant milk. Um, it's great to add into smoothies or to overnight oats or even your, your porridge. Um, it, you can mix it in with a yogurt and some seeds and maybe some berries. And then, of course, you can make uh, like protein balls, you know, with peanut butter and oats and, uh, and cacao. Um, I have a recipe for some uh, sweet potato uh, chocolate brownies as well, which uses cacao. Um, you know, so there, there are loads of recipes and I'll put some links into the show notes uh, to give you some more ideas. Um, I would add them into when I'm making some almond cookies as well. You know, the chocolate chips can be cacao nibs or dark chocolate chips. And, um, you know, that actually, uh, as I say, even if you're not a fan of dark chocolate because it is a little bit more bitter, um, you know, that is a good way of when you mix it in with other ingredients, um, it just sort of takes that, the, you know, you don't notice the bitterness so much until you, your, your taste changes. I used to be addicted to milk chocolate. You know, I always had a basket of milk chocolate treats in the fridge and and anybody who came into the house, you know, uh, knew knew where they were. But um, my taste has totally changed now once I started eating dark chocolate. And I wouldn't actually thank you for milk chocolate now, you know. So it is possible to, to change what you think of as, as a treat. And hopefully some of those uh, benefits will encourage you to, to try it and add it into your shopping trolley this week. 